Welcome back. I hope you had a good holiday if you celebrate Thanksgiving. I had a pretty decent one. had a weird sore throat problem, um, but I'm starting to recover from it and feel a lot better now, so that's good. And I actually didn't have a big turkey. Uh, I am half Lebanese, so we actually had some Middle Eastern food. We had kibbeh, which is a minced meat dish uh, mixed with bulgur, which is actually quite good. I enjoyed it a lot. But today, we are going to be talking about hosting your projects and where are some good options if you want to save money and deploy on a budget. So the general way to save money when deploying things is to spend more time setting them up yourself rather than paying a service to set up stuff for you. Now, the first thing that we're going to look at is cloud providers. Now, they kind of break the rule because they do this thing where they have a juicy free tier. So AWS has it where they offer a bunch of free stuff uh, for their services for 12 months. Azure has a similar thing where for 12 months they offer you free services and they also throw in a $200 credit for 30 days. Now AWS I believe also gives you like a $100 credit you can get somewhere um, and all of these cloud providers have random promotions where they're throwing money at you. Also, Google Cloud has one where you just get straight $300 for 12 months, um, and then they also have some always free stuff. So these guys are kind of cheating because they don't actually charge you anything, usually until after a year of using them, or until you pass their free usage, which usually doesn't happen right away. So there's this illusion of value that you're able to not spend anything and get a ton of services and so this is the exception to the rule where you're able to leverage some of this stuff short term and that's the key thing these are great options if you want to set up a project that you think maybe take a year to set up or something you're going to have low traffic at first and then after that you see yourself growing the project and starting to get more users and hopefully generating some revenue through your service, um, and then you can pay for some of the higher prices uh, that the cloud services are going to charge. Because that is the way they function. They try to hook you in with the free services. You get set up in using them. You're using their services, so it's harder to migrate away and use a different service. It's easier to just stay where you are. So when the free tier is up, you continue using them and you start using their paid versions of whatever you're getting from free before. And this is where it starts to get more expensive than some of the other options. But with that said, I still think this is a super legit way to go, especially if you see yourself in the short term having a smaller budget, but in the long term having a more flexible or larger budget to work with, especially because it's always going to be cheaper to hire Google Cloud to manage, for example, your database or your servers than it is to hire a human to monitor and make sure those things are working. And so if you wanna start cheap and then get some of the services that are gonna be handled for you, I think a cloud free tier and then paying later is a great option to go with. Now, there's some other things to consider when choosing a cloud provider too. There's two things that I do not like about them. The first is their complexity just to set up and use. So they have gone to the point now where they are just supporting so many use cases and so many different services that their dashboards are getting very, very complex. And they are offering certificates to learn AWS or you get certified to show that you actually know how to use AWS now because it is that complex. And you actually put on your resume that you are capable of using AWS because it is getting to that point where you really need to study it to fully understand how it works and make sure you're using it correctly. And so that really ties in with the second thing. You can really easily mess up and the pricing is not always super transparent. It's very easy to spin up a lot of different services underneath the hood and then all of a sudden you have a larger bill than you were expecting. So it's not always clear how much you're going to be spending when you actually start using these cloud providers. So once you've decided you actually want to use a cloud provider, the next question is, which one should you use? Should you go with Google, Microsoft, Azure, or Amazon's AWS? 
Now, this is a video in its own, which one should you choose? And this is also just not the only options. Oracle has a cloud. These just happen to be the biggest ones. And I would probably recommend just starting with AWS because this happens to be the one that is used the most. So it's gonna carry over this skill set to know AWS is actually getting pretty important. Uh, and a lot of different jobs uh, need it and you'll use it in a lot of different places. Uh, but I'm gonna leave an in-depth comparison for a separate video. Okay, so that is option number one. Go with a cloud and take advantage of their generous free tiers. Now, option number two is one that I personally use, and it's where we get more into setting stuff up ourselves. And I'm gonna split this into four categories. Number one is hosting our database. Number two is hosting our server. Number three is hosting our front end. Uh, so server more our back end side and then our front end side, our website. And then lastly, what about user uploaded images? Now I'm choosing that because that's a very common thing that you usually have in your application and something you need to think about and affects how you host. So starting with the database, this is what I would not recommend using if you're on a budget. And the reason for that is it gets very expensive very quickly. And that is these hosted database options that are getting more popular. So one example of this is MLAP, where they will host a MongoDB database for you. And you can see here, it costs $15 per gigabyte. And that is very expensive. A gigabyte is not a lot of data. But if you take into the fact why this is so much, it makes sense. And that's because you're not just getting a database. You are getting backups included for you, you're getting support, free transfer, analytics, hardware costs, and maybe some other stuff thrown in there. Um, but it's something where if your database crashes, you don't have to go in there and handle that stuff. They have a team that is making sure your database is up and running and functioning correctly. And so that can be really nice, but it can be really expensive. So another option uh, that's similar to this is with Redis Labs, where they are hosting a Redis instance for you. And here you can see it is $22 a month for one gigabyte. And for five gigabytes, it is $105 a month. So very quickly with not a lot of gigs, um, it gets very pricey. Um, but again, they are doing extra stuff for you. And again, depending on your plan, you get more stuff. And so if you need these extra services, maybe you wanna consider these things, but not everybody needs all of these things. And it's one of those things where for a lot of sites, if your database crashes, it's okay to have an hour of downtime where you go in there and you fix it yourself. That usually isn't too problematic for most sites. Uh, it's just the fact that you don't really need 99% uptime all the time. And it's a very rare case that your database crashes. At least it should be. If it isn't, you may want to consider switching your database uh, or changing something up. So what I like to do instead is host the database in a virtual private server. So for example, DigitalOcean is a company that sells these. So is Vulture and there's a ton like this where basically you get a little computer and you can install whatever software you want in there and host projects. And so it's also very flexible. So not only can I stick uh, MongoDB, but I can also stick Redis on there. And so I'm not limited to just hosting a single database on there, uh, but I can host multiple databases and I can also include my backend server. So personally, what I will do for small projects is I will set up a single virtual machine, which I will stick my database and I'll also stick my server on it. So they're close together. Now, again, this may not be optimal in all cases because if my database crashes, so does my entire application. But in a lot of cases, this is an acceptable amount of risk and I think is a great option if you are doing a small to medium sized project and you see using this or building this over a long term because it is a cheaper price. And if you want some of these other services, um, along with just you know hosting your database, you will need to set these up yourself, which can be a pro or a con. The pro is you can set it up however you like and you get a ton of flexibility with it. You get to choose the analytic tool that you use or you get to pick the way that you're backing up your database. So for example, backups were something that I really wanted. So what I do is I have a cron job, which runs every day, and it backs up the database and saves the database to S3, um, so on AWS on Amazon. And so I have backups made every day and 
make sure I don't lose any data still. And to give you a little insight into what I actually like to use to manage everything on the virtual machine, I like this open source software called Docu, which works very similar to Heroku, where you just push up your code and add in some database add-ons and you just let it handle the rest for you. You don't have to touch Nginx or mapping subdomains and it's very easy to get Let's Encrypt set up so you have HTTPS. And so I actually have, and you can run several different servers from this single virtual machine. And so I have Postgres running in there and Redis and then also my backend server. And so being able to handle all those things in a single box or single server is pretty cost efficient. So how much do these virtual private machines actually cost? Well, here is the pricing table for Vulture. So you can see it starts at 250 a month and it goes up from there. And it really just depends on how much memory and how much CPU you need um, or you want. Now, it's not just about those two things though. And so that's one of the things that I naively would compare before. So for example, we can look at the price table here and the price table of DigitalOcean, and we can see they're pretty comparable, at least with the amount of memory and CPUs and transfer and disk and that sort of thing that you get compared to each other. Um, but that doesn't mean you're going to get similar performance, and the underlying software that Vulture and DigitalOcean use could be totally different. And so to be honest with you, I have no idea which VPS provider you should choose. I'm personally trying out a couple different ones right now to try to figure out which one I like the best. I'm playing around with this one called SSD nodes, but I have no idea if they're any good. But here is the thing that I think is the true test is to just do benchmarks and to see which one benchmarks the best is probably the best way to choose between these. And so one place that does this, there's this Jostronic blog that compares them. And so it gives you a nice side-by-side -side of these five providers. And they'll actually go into CPU and some other things, memory, and compare the speeds of them and see which one you're actually getting. You know, you may pay $10 for each one of these. Which one's actually going to give you the most performance, best memory, um, or best CPU, or et cetera. Another place that I found that was pretty interesting was called VPS Benchmarks, where you could actually compare two different uh, VPSs and their speeds and whatnot. Um, so if you go to compare, or maybe providers is where it was, I could actually, actually let's do compare VPS providers. And so I could click Vulture and I could click Google Cloud Compute or Compute Engine, I mean. We could actually compare these and get a breakdown um, of their both their pricing and also in each category they kind of rate them on performance and whatnot. And you can even get into more fine grained things down here um, on the performance at different levels. So if you're into this thing and you wanna dive into this, you could, send, you could consider looking at these different benchmarks and maybe that'll help you pick. Um, but in this particular category, I have no idea which one is the best. Vulture seems to consistently be one that across several different benchmarks performs pretty well. And I've used it, and it's been a positive experience. So it's one I feel confident um, uh, recommending starting with at least. Um, but there may be some better ones out there. So let me know if you have a favorite uh, on what you actually choose for this. But in general, price-wise, they're pretty comparative. And they offer about the same CPU, about the same memory. So it really comes down to the performance of each one of what they're giving you. Okay, so the VPS will handle your backend and your database. Now, for your front-end... This only really matters if you're not doing server-side rendering. So if you're doing Jamstack or you have a static website, aka if you're using Create React app, you're using Gatsby, something like that, I actually like to host it on Netlify. If you are doing server-side rendering, aka you're using Django, Ruby on Rails, using Next.js, something like that, um, where you are actually you know, rendering the pages from your server, then you can actually just stick it with your VPS and you can do it there. So this is for static sites. I like to split them off and not render them in the VPS because you can get a really nice free tier from Netlify. And so it will take some load off of your server if you can serve static files here. So what I'll do is I believe it's up to 100 gigabytes of uh, bandwidth that you get for actually being able to host here. And so that'll last you a very long time. And static websites are so easy to 
like migrate who you're hosting with, it's very easy to, if you reach over the hundred gigs, which will give you, give you for free, it's very easy to switch if you wanna go somewhere else. Um, but you may even wanna stick with Netlify. I personally just really like the experience with deploying here. It's very easy, it's very quick, and I like it a lot. So this is where I would go, just totally free for front end your website if it's static. So lastly, let's talk about handling user uploaded images. So I'm not talking about, you know, you have some assets on your landing page. I'm talking about your Twitter, your Facebook, your someplace where you wanna handle the user uploading stuff and displaying their custom images and they could upload them at any time. And so you wanna be able to handle that. So I wanna first talk about the approach that I like the best. And then we're gonna talk about how you can accomplish that approach. So this is the one that I really like, and that is to store wherever they upload, um, store it at that size. So if they upload an image that happens to be 900 by 900, you save it as 900 by 900. Now the thing is, your website may need it at a different size or may need some different settings on the image. So what you'll do is when you request the image, you will give it some parameters. For example, the width and height that you need. Um, or maybe you need this width, right? And so what we'll do is the service will uh, resize it, get to the width that you want it on the fly, then it will cache it, and then it'll give you the image. So this is something where the first time it may take slightly longer because it needs to dynamically create the image at the new size on the server, and it's gonna give you the image. So the nice part of this approach is you have the original image at 900 by 900, and then you can resize it to whatever you want, right? So as your requirements for the website change, or maybe you need different sizes in different places, it's very easy to be able to just change the URL parameter. You don't have to go generating a bunch of files ahead of time, the right size that you want. Now I've tried doing this approach um, myself and putting this logic um, on DigitalOcean or Vulture or one of those places. Um, but to be honest, it is just a headache to try to do. Well, it's not so much it's a headache to actually set up. It's more of a headache to try to get performant. And I was never able to get to a speed that I was quite happy with. I even tried sticking Cloudflare in front. Uh, but even then, when images loaded, it was just a lot slower than some of the other options. So I would actually recommend in this case, at least I haven't had much success trying to do it myself. This is where I actually do like using a service to handle dynamically resizing images for me. So there are two places that I know of that can do this image thing for you. So the first one is Cloudinary and they are great on a budget. At least their free tier handles quite a bit of images. So you pay nothing upfront similar to how with the cloud provider has a nice free tier and then maybe you'll be paying more later but the hard thing i have with this service is or the hard thing to tell from this is they give you monthly credits so for example the free tier you get 25 and just a side note i really hate when these companies create their own little currency like this it's very hard to try to figure out how the currency maps to actual spending but anyway, you get 25 credits, which then use to 100 or 1,000 transformations, one gig of storage, or one gig of net viewing bandwidth. You get the gist. So the credits could go to some amount of image processing. So it's really hard to tell when exactly you would hit the threshold to be paying $89 a month. To be honest, I'm not quite sure when, how big of a project you really need or how much usage you'd have before you reach the threshold because it's kind of hard to calculate ahead of time how much your image usage is going to be. So that's my main beef with Cloudinary. I think it's really nice. I think the service is good, but I personally haven't used them a ton because I feel like their pricing is a little less transparent uh, than the second option, which is ImageX. So with this company, how it works is you pay $3 per 1,000 images and then $0.08 cents per gigabyte of bandwidth. And then you can transform the image with the properties, height, width, and then they have a thousand other transformations you can do uh, as, many, as many times as you want and it doesn't cost extra. So I have a very hard time trying to compare this pricing to Cloudinaries and trying to figure out, well, with this many credits, how much is it gonna be um, on ImageX? I'm not really sure. So if someone's done the math, 
do let me know. But my gut instinct says uh, once you pass the free tier of Cloudinary, I feel like Imagix is going to be less money. Uh, but to be honest, I have no idea. Um, but I think both of them are pretty good options. I've really enjoyed Imagix as a service. I thought it's worked out really great. Um, but they don't have a free tier. Cloudinary does. So maybe Cloudinary just strictly wins. And maybe it's even cheaper at the plus tier. If that was the case, I probably should probably switch to Cloudinary. Um, but I am personally using Imagix right now, liking them. But these are two really good options for handling your images. But there you go. In conclusion, I like to use cloud services if I'm doing a project where in the long term I see it making a lot of money, but maybe in the short term I want to take advantage of the free tier. Otherwise, I like putting my back end, my server, on a virtual machine, for example, using Vulture, and then serving my website on Netlify and hosting my images on either Cloudinary or on Imagix. Also, one thing I totally forgot to mention, Cloudinary will actually host your images. Imagix you don't, doesn't actually host your images. I forgot, that's like a huge difference actually. Uh, so I actually have my images stored on Google Cloud Storage and then Imagix is kind of a cache layer in front of it. So that's a big thing to know, difference between the two. Um, but yeah, I've liked Imagix. Uh, that's just a heads up. So there you go. That is how you can deploy on a budget.